fabulous. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Now, it's a good afternoon to all of you. It's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces. So today I'm going to present some ongoing research and its aim is to improve museums' online content. But today I'm going to focus in particular on social media metrics. Now, I'm going to provide a brief overview in the context of the wider project before digging into the results of our pilot study. Now, in the last section of my presentation, I'm going to explore why all of this matters and what implications it might have for the museum sector. And ultimately, my talk today is going to be a little bit of a provoca provocation. I want to hear what you guys think because I'm becoming increasingly skeptical of how useful widespread digital adoption and social media is in the museum sector. So, without further ado, there were some very large claims made of museums' online content during the pandemic. There was a widespread idea that digital content would revolutionize audience engagement and reach beyond museums' traditional visitor base. As Lucas Nora and his colleagues said, the pandemic has elicited engagement with audiences beyond the classic visitor spectrum, including people who have never been to a gallery in person before. But this idea has increasingly come under scrutiny. The Audience Agency and the Center for Cultural Value found in a survey of over 6,000 participants that the demographics of on-site and online audiences are pretty much the same. For the most part, online visitors have engaged with museums before, and the majority of them are over the age of 55. So in giving an overview of our research today, I'm going to start to answer some of those tentative questions that I've posed there. But to provide an overview, our research started from a very simple place with two main questions. I wanted to know, what are museums doing online? And in and amongst everything they're doing, what is working well? The idea was that having established this, I could then go on to experiment with new types of content and digital strategies. But it turns out establishing what an entire sector has done over the last five years is not a trivial task. Now, there was far less data than I had anticipated, so we managed to use TripAdvisor, and our eventual aim is to create a data set of over 40,000 European museums, catching websites' URLs, their social media data, and information from their websites. Now, our eventual plan is to use natural language processing and clustering algorithms to identify different digital strategies and how they've changed over time. We'd also like to know and understand what success looks like for different types of museums. Now, we be, that's obviously a large undertaking with over 40,000 museums, so we tested our methodology with a small pilot study of 315 museums in the UK. Now, if you'd like to know more about our methodology and the in-depth statistics of this study, please do check out the QR code at the end of uh, my presentation. Um, but we decided in and amongst that study to focus on the platform YouTube. With more and more museums adopting social media when they close their sites during the pandemic, we thought that curator talks, exhibition tours, and um, live online events that were later uploaded to the platform would make it a likely site of change. And this proved to be entirely correct. So as you can see here, there was a massive increase in the number of videos uploaded to the platform in 2020. But really interestingly, this didn't correspond with an increase in the number of views. In fact, museums' online audiences are embarrassingly small. 50% of the YouTube channels in our study had 45 subscribers or less, and only the two largest museums actually saw a significant increase in views over the lockdown period. So that's the British Museum and the Royal Academy. So, larger museums do generally um, dominate the online cultural landscape. And this makes sense. Across all platforms, they have Ooh. <laughs> it's back, it's fine. <laughs> um, across all platforms, they have uh, specialist digital teams who are able to upload content regularly. And on top of that, they're able to collect data about their users and engagement. But does that mean that their content itself is more engaging? To figure this out, I looked at the single most popular video on the single most popular YouTube channel. Now. This orange line here is the views over time of the British Museum's video, Vikings Live. Uploaded in May of 2020, it currently sits at over 8 million views and was by far the most popular video in our data set. Now, this is quite unusual as the video itself is over an hour and a half long. 
And considering that the average YouTube video is less than 15 minutes in length, this makes it something of an outlier. Originally, it wasn't actually designed to be uploaded in YouTube, but was first recorded in 2014 and broadcast live to cinemas across the UK. It was only re-uploaded during the pandemic period, which makes its success even more unusual, as it's usually native YouTube content that performs best on the platform. So, ostensibly, this is great news. It means that museums don't necessarily have to conform to what is thought to be popular on each platform. If people are interested in it, they'll watch it. But the keen-eyed amongst you will have noticed that there's another line on that graph. And this represents the views of Pompeii Live. Much like Vikings Live, it was recorded in 2013. It was broadcast live to UK cinemas. It's an hour and a half long. It shares a format and even presenters with Vikings Live. And yet you can see that their reception is incredibly different. Now, if we zoom in to when they were first uploaded, you can see that the reception of Viking, uh, sorry, Pompeii Live is much more usual of the um, average YouTube video. It at first sees a spike in views before this levels out over time. And this log normal distribution is completely usual of the platform. And that's because the YouTube recommendation algorithm has a preference for new, fresh content. Now, if people were discovering this video via the British Museum website or other um, kind of social media channels, you would expect to see a slight increase in views during the second lockdown period, here highlighted in orange, which you can see does happen to Vikings Live. But notably, Renjie Jo and his colleagues found that the recommendation algorithm has a far bigger impact, especially long term, on the number of views a video receives than it being publicized on other social media channels or websites. And this includes when the video is embedded on other pages. So it seems unlikely that links from the British Museum's website or their social media had an impact in the relative success of these two videos. So it could be that Vikings are just an inherently more interesting topic than Romans. And at the time, I'll grant you, that there were a number of TV series about Vikings on Netflix and other streaming platforms. But if you're going to constantly be chasing what happens to be a trending topic at the time, you might have a high, um, it's incredibly difficult to find success. And we as researchers and museum professionals themselves don't really understand how the platform, uh, platform algorithms work. As Nick Harris, the senior producer at the British Museum, um, uh, the senior uh, producer at the British Museum said in a recent video, he asked audiences to give the new videos a like when they come out. We would really appreciate it as it massively helps with the algorithm, which, to be honest, hasn't been that kind to us of late. If the British Museum, with its extensive digital team and resources, is str struggling to successfully navigate this platform, what hope do the vast majority of other museums have? Now, I think... Oops, oh, yeah. So it poses an interesting question for us, because how do we evaluate success of online content when it isn't a level playing field? Are we going to consider success just those who are best able to adapt to the whims of the recommendation algorithms? Now, this has two major impacts on the museum sector and two points of concern for me. Firstly, museums, as we saw in the first slide, have an interest in expanding, broadening, and diversifying their online audiences. And it's true that the recommenda recommendation algorithm might hinder this effort. A YouTube video is far more, far more likely to be recommended to someone who has previously watched other museum YouTube videos. And more insidiously still, it's more likely to be recommended by someone who shares attributes with users who have previously watched that kind of video. So this could be they have a shared viewing history, but it could also be demographic attributes like age and gender. And we need to bear in mind that recommendation systems are currently at play on all of the major social media platforms. So this isn't just a problem on YouTube. It's incredibly likely that these recommendation algorithms disproportionately recommend museums' content to existing audiences. Now, the second one is more worrying still. The types of content uh, prioritized by recommendation algorithms may well be at odds with the types of interactions museums are trying to foster. Now, there's a vast body of literature on social media engagement and how it impacts mental health, but it's been found time and time again that highly emotive content results in high levels of social media engagement. Grace G and her colleagues have found that 
posts that incite negative emotions are far more likely to be shared on Facebook and thus further distributed across the platform. Now, we actually found this in our own data set, uh, data collected by the Mapping Museum project team and kindly given for, to us to analyze, we found that the number of sad reaction emojis put on a post directly correlates with the number of shares it has. So no matter what the museum's intention, when it comes down to it, they are another social media user and are bound by the same infrastructure as every other user on the site. So the reason I've put this slide up here is that it really came to the fore in our own data set. This one here stood out. You can see um, from the image that it's a Facebook post that is a photograph from 1997 taken by John Boucher. It shows the image of a soldier pointing his rifle at the photographer. This was shared 42 times, but in the previous post by the same artist on the same themes, but with a much less provocative image, that of a frozen Union Jack flag, was only shared two times. If we optimize content for performance on social media, what will our online cultural landscape start to look like? And what kind of content will museums start to create? So I hope that I've uh, been able to express that social media engagement doesn't necessarily represent audience engagement in a way that museums will find meaningful. And in chasing higher social media metrics, museums may even hinder their own attempts to broaden their audiences and uh, diversify who they're reaching online. So I hope this has highlighted just how important developing our own uh, metrics for the sector are and why we need things like this larger data set on which we can perform our analysis. But yeah, thank you very much.